A few weeks ago, I read in the news that only five kilometers from my house, in the city of Veenendaal, the tiger mosquito was found. It was the first time that the mosquito has been discovered in a residential area. And it frightened me. It really frightened me. Because the tiger mosquito is infamous for its notoriously aggressive biting behavior. It bites from morning till, uh, till in the night. It can also transmit diseases like dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Who hasn't heard about the, the upcoming emergence of, of, of Zika in the world? Now, if we look to the European map, then the red spots are the areas where it's already a pest species. In some of these places, it is transmitting dengue and chikungunya. And it's spreading to the north. So it made me wonder how long uh, or will we be able to control this uh, tiger mosquito close by? How long will it be before my daughters in, don't want to splay outside because of this nasty mosquito? And how long will it be before it starts transmitting diseases in our country? So the appearance of the tiger mosquito, to my opinion, is only one of the many signs of the big transformations that are ongoing in our environment in response to changes in climate. And climate is changing. Because cl climate change is one of the biggest transformations that we currently face as a society. Look at this graph uh, behind me. It shows the increase in temperature, global average temperature, since 1880. 2016 has been uh, by far the warmest year ever recorded. 2015 was the second warmest, and 2014 has been the third warmest year ever recorded. In the Netherlands, 2014 so far has been the warmest year ever recorded. And uh, we had temperatures that were comparable to Lyon, that is way uh, down in France, but then 30 years ago. Now, if we look at this year, only a few weeks ago, September, you might remember, we had beautiful, a very warm, very dry and very sunny September. If you go back to the winter, we had three months with exceptionally high temperatures. And December, it was unbelievable. We had a temperature, average temperature in December, that was comparable, or it was even higher than the normal April temperatures 50 years ago. We had spring in the middle of the winter. Um, in, in, in May and June this year, we had a very heavy rainfalls. Now, and I can go on and on and on in, in explaining you or showing you those, those weather extremes. And as a biologist, I look at how plants and animals are responding to these changes, and they indeed massively respond. And I just give you a number of examples. If you go outside, you see a lot of beech nuts. And it was already the, for the fourth year in a row that there were beech nuts on the beech trees. And that is exceptional because normally, every, once every two years, this happens. And because of the increase in temperatures, we see this uh, happening more and more often. Another example, New Year, last New Year, we had 735 plant species in flower in the middle of the winter, one-fifth of our flora. Never happened before. Christmas last year, butterflies flying around. <laughs> Have you seen butterflies with Christmas before? Um, the red admiral and the peacock butterfly uh, and, and some other species were still present. And 2015 was also special, that this common European viper was seen in every month of the year. Now, in my work, one of my main projects at Wageningen University is Nature's Calendar. Together with thousands of volunteers and hundreds of school children, we monitor the timing of the start and the end of the growing season. And something spectacular is happening there. So, uh, the average length of the growing season in the last 15 years was about almost 30 days longer than it used to be 50 years ago. Now, plants and animals are not only adjusting their timing, they also move northwards. They migrate to the north in response and trying to follow these uh, changes in temperature. And the oak processionary moth, which we see here, didn't live in the Netherlands before 20, uh, 25 years ago. It was south in France. Now, it spread all over the country. And this year, we had record high numbers of this uh, butterfly. And next year, the oak processionary caterpillar, uh, and each caterpillar has hundreds of thousands of urticating hairs, it will probably cause health problems in many parts of our country. Um, also plants, we have by now, let's say, one, way over 100 new warm-loving, often Mediterranean plant species living in our country. They never lived here before. 
but also animals. This velvet crab is colonizing our coastal waters. And look at these two beautiful, magnificent birds. Aren't they beautiful? Um, they are southern species, the European bee eaters, and they now breed in our country. Uh, and the final example is that the, uh, the southern darter, this magnificent uh, uh, dragonfly, it's also colonizing our country. And these are all signs that plants and animals are rapidly responding, adapting to changing in climate. And what do we do? What do we do as a society? Do we adapt? Uh, yes, we do. But it's by far not enough to keep up with the changes. Um, there are, however, positive signs that um, society is waking up. And this is an example. Last December, at the climate conference in Paris, um, 195 governments agreed that they would try to limit the increase in temperature up to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. That sounds as good news, but you, you must know that we already increased with 0.9 degrees Celsius uh, up till this very moment. And with the rapid increase of greenhouse, gases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it is very likely that the temperature will rise much more, way beyond this 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. So, how are we responding? How do you respond? How do you adapt in your personal and your private life? Um, Often, yeah, that's the tendency of people, we think, oh, the government will solve that. The government is responsible for uh, preventing climate change to happen, and this is an example. Um, but the government is also responsible for adaptation to climate change. Yeah, and that, that is not the case, because I want to focus on adaptation. Adaptation, and why adaptation? Because climate change is real. Everyone in this room Actually, everyone on this globe is already facing, experiencing climate change and its impacts. And the impacts will be way worse in the end, by the end of this century. Um, and that's, yeah, we are only at the beginning of the climate transformation that is ongoing. And that's why I think that each and every one of you in this room should be responsible for its own uh, adaptation, for in your personal life and in your business life. And yeah, let me be clear, I do not ask from you to save the planet. Although, if there is someone in the room that can do so, please, please stand up. But um, no, that's not what I ask from you today. I ask from you to look at yourself, your family, um, and your neighborhood, and your, your, your job, your work. And it's perfectly fine to have a more selfish approach in this. That's, that's what I do. But um, yeah, do you know how to adapt? and especially when to adapt. Now, my suggestion is use the weather extremes. Use the heat waves, the hailstorms, the, 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 the flooding that we have in the very hot winters. These provide us with a wonderful view in our climate future, in your climate future. Um, but if such a climate extremes happens, you have to do three things. You have to evaluate, you have to think, and you have to act. So evaluate what are the impacts that you're currently experiencing or your family or at your work. But then think, what would happen if the, the, the extreme would have been 10, 20, 30, 40% worse than it was uh, now? And then act. Do the thing so that the next time it happens, the negative impacts will be lower and the pos possible positive impacts will be even bigger. Now, let me give you a number of examples um, to make it more clear. Think back to September this year. We had a beautiful end of the summer, didn't we? We had uh, temperatures way above 30 degrees Celsius. We had dry, sunny weather. But how did you sleep those warm nights? How was the, the temperature in your office? Could you still be productive? And were your kids sent uh, home early because it was too hot in schools? Now imagine if the, uh, the number of very warm days was not only five, but maybe 10, 15, 20 days in a row. What would you do? Now, you could consider to uh, install uh, sunblinds or uh, air, uh, air conditioning, or maybe save money to install air conditioning later. You can also negotiate with your boss whether you can work with flexible work hours. Um, and if you are head of a school, you can already discuss with your colleagues or with the parents what to do in these kind of situations that you start and end earlier. Now, let me show you another example, air pollution. You know that we all live a few days shorter, probably, because of the very high, uh, uh, the, the bad air quality conditions in the beginning of September. These, are really, these were very high uh, bad air quality conditions. And what did you do? Did you send your, your kids to play football? 
that you went for, uh, for a run to lose weight and to improve your health? I wouldn't do that in these kind of situations. So how do you adapt to that? Now maybe you install the air quality app, so you stay informed about what's ongoing. Um, or, and that's maybe more difficult, call the municipality or the political parties and ask them, what do you do to improve the situation there? Another example, we have a lot of forest here in, uh, in our municipality, so I assume that some of you live in the forest. What did the, what did the uh, high temperatures and the dry condition do with the risk for droughts and also the risk for wildfires? So what would happen if it would be drier and warmer? Yeah? So now maybe, uh, no, not maybe, have an evacuation plan ready. And check your insurance. Is the insurance uh, covering costs uh, or damage costs uh, caused by, uh, by uh, wildfires? And if you're at an insurance company, you better check uh, the, the scenarios and maybe adjust your insurance policy too. And the same can be said, for example, with the flooding, if you go back to May and, and June this year, with a very, also, uh, very severe uh, hailstorm we had. What did it do to your greenhouse? What did it do to your garden? Did you have flooding in your basement or in, in your, in, on, the, on the first floor? Um, that might be a moment to check with, again, your municipality or the water boards or your neighbors to see what you can do and how you can prevent this the thing the next time. Because this month we had record high uh, precipitation of, let's say, one, uh, 177 millimeters. What would happen if it, is, it was 277? What would happen if it was uh, uh, 350? So you have to start uh, thinking about that. So I hope that I made clear that we can use these extreme weather events. They provide us a magnificent uh, insight in our future climate. And we have time to transform our society to these changes, but we have to hurry there. And I also think that it's perfectly fine if you focus on your own personal and your, your business uh, life. Because I think that even if we all, or uh, quite a large number of us uh, look at ourselves and see how we can adapt, that we as a society will be extremely adaptive to climate change. So the next time a weather extreme occurs, evaluate, you think and you act, and then you adapt. So thank you for your attention and good luck. <laughs>